Championship Series. From Jack Murphy Stadium in San Diego, California, it's the Chicago Cubs and the San Diego Padres. Yesterday in Game 2, Steve Kraut handcuffed the Padres, allowing only five hits and two runs in eight and a third innings. He forced the Padres into 17 ground ball outs. And when Kraut came out, in came hard-throwing Lee Smith to shut the door on San Diego. The tall right-hander retired the final two batters to ice a 4-2 win for the Cubs. So, as the series moves west to San Diego for Game 3, the Cubs can finish things off tonight and move on to the World Series for the first time in 39 years. Stadium here in San Diego, a huge crowd on hand. They are still filing in, they say. With a full house tonight, it will set a new Major League record for Major League Baseball here in San Diego. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to Jack Murphy Stadium. I'm Don Drysdale, and happy that you've joined us tonight. Game three of the championship series in the National League. And if you've been following, everybody across the country knows what has to happen. Jimmy Fry in one clubhouse is looking for a win to go on back to Chicago and pick up a pennant for the Chicago Cubs the first time since 1945. Dick Williams has said it very flatly. We've got to win tonight to be able to come back and win Saturday. We've got to sweep the Cubs in three. But working with me again is Earl Weaver and Reggie Jackson. And Earl, as you look at this trend as far as the first two games are concerned, there has been one as far as the Cubs are concerned and the Padres also. Well, I believe there has. Uh, the Chicago Cubs have done what they wanted to do. Ron Sandberg and Bob Denier, the two men at the top of the order, have been on base 11 out of 18 times. Now, along with putting pressure on the defense with their speed, what this does is set the table for the hitters behind them. Three, four, five, six hitters in the Cub lineup have had people to get on. On the other hand, the San Diego Padres with Alan Wiggins and Tony Gwynn they've only been on base three out of 17 times so the RBI opportunities haven't been there and as a result the Padres haven't gotten the number of runs they needed no there's no question about that as a matter of fact they've scored only two and that was yesterday and Reggie we've all been through this before we've been down in the counts in postseason play if you're a member of the San Diego Padres what are you looking at right now well, right now, Donnie, you know that you've only scored two runs. The Cubs have scored 17 runs, and I'm pretty sure that the ball club knows that they've only hit 183, and the Cubs have hit almost twice that much. Someone on that, from that ball club has to go around and start slapping guys on the back. Maybe it should be a Steve Garvey or a Greg Nettles or a Rich Gossage or a Terry Kennedy, but someone has to step forward and lead this ball club back from almost no offense at all. I don't know if you can look for one of the young kids to do it. I almost don't think it's fair for a Wiggins, for a Wiggins or a Gwynn. I think one of the big guys has to do it. Again, Donnie, let's remember that this team is down two games to nothing. In 1982, the California Angels were up two games to nothing, went to Milwaukee, and we got beat three straight. That is so true. And Earl, very quickly, of course, you look at if Dick Williams, if you're a manager, do you have a meeting? Do you walk around individually, talk to the players, or what? Well, I definitely wouldn't have a meeting. They know what they have to do. But I would get to each individual player if I could. I said, Look, if we lose, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. But when that sun comes up, let's be playing ball. And Reggie, if you are the veteran, do you talk to the youngsters? Do you say try and get away from the five-run homer? You have a job to do, Donnie, and what one of the veterans has to do. I remember in 1973, Gene Tennis came around to me and he said, hey, big guy, I'd like to play tomorrow. One of the big guys from the Padres has to accept that responsibility, step forward and do it. Well, we have a new set of amateur umpires tonight and still only four as far as the National League is concerned. But we've talked about Ryan Sandberg. We're going to give you a chance to look at the fine young second base for the Chicago Cubs. In January of 1982, Dallas Green completed a coup, acquiring Ryan Sandberg and Larry Boa for Yvonne De Jesus. It was a trade that'll have Philly fanatics stirring for years and the fans on the north side of Chicago screaming MVP. Well, I've been hearing a about it a lot, and uh, you know, I haven't really thought about it that much. Uh, you know, the thing that we wanted to do this year was win a pennant for, for the city of Chicago, and you know, we did that. and. Uh, you know, I was just thinking about uh, playing good ball for the for the Chicago Cubs uh, so that we could reach that goal. And, you know, once we did that, uh, then I was I was real relaxed and real happy about it. It has certainly been a season to remember this summer of 84. Near the top in almost every offensive category, Sandberg has set new standards for second baseman. Look at what's happened to me. I can't believe that my 
the winter, it's off to Tempe, Arizona, but the summers are now spent in a Chicago suburb. For the Sandbergs, it's been exciting, all this new success, but it hasn't been that easy, as his wife Cindy explains. We don't go anywhere. Oh. We tried his last off day to go shopping, and we didn't make it to the first department store without him signing about 25 autographs. This was the first store, and within an hour and a half, we both decided, this isn't worth it, let's go home. You know, so... It, it's got its, its drawbacks, but it, it's been a, a, an exciting and interesting year for us. If he does win the MVP, would he feel it's deserving? <laughs> Tough question. Uh, you know, that means that, uh, that I, I'd have been the guy who, you know, most helped the ball club win. And, uh, you know, I think that I've done a good job this year. Uh, you know, the, uh, I set some goals uh, to be a more consistent player. and. Uh, you know, all that I was concerned about was helping the Cubs win, and we accomplished that. Well, indeed, they did accomplish that. Ryan Sandberg has helped them win. He's helped them move one rug up on the ladder. They've won the Eastern Division title. They are right now just one victory away from the National League Championship, and we'll know what will go on after tonight's game. And moving across and over at second base, you'll find Alan Wiggins. Wiggins will be at second base over at shortstop is Gary Templeton. Templeton will be at short. Over at third base and back in the lineup tonight will be the veteran Greg Nettles. Nettles out yesterday with a bruised hand in left field will be Carmelo Martinez. Over in center field will be the young center fielder Kevin McReynolds. And over in right field you will see the National League batting champion Tony Gwynn. Behind the plate and doing the catching will be Terry Kennedy. And the starting pitcher tonight will be right-hander Ed Whitson, a record of 14 and 8 on the year. This will be his 32nd start here in 1984. 29 years of age, born in Johnson City, Tennessee. Now makes his home in Columbus, Ohio. He's a 6'3", 195-pounder. The umpires for tonight's game we mentioned a new set. Terry Bova behind the plate. Frank Campagna at first with Frank Fisher at second and John Stewart over at third. Still the National League electing to go with only four. These men are from Arizona as they have worked some exhibition games over in Arizona. Terry Bova, the home plate umpire. He's been umpire for 16 years, 36 years of age. The ten, last 10 years he's worked at the college level. He's attended what they call the blue chip umpiring clinics. And we're about ready to go as Dernier takes outside. So game number three underway. Dernier, three for six in the series. And indeed, he has been part of the catalytic twosome as far as these Cubs are concerned. Well, he don't want to get behind this hitter. He's supposed to have a good fastball, according to the slider uh, scouting report. Slow curve, slider's a real good pitch for him. And he's behind 3-0 now. His changeup is a pound ball. No one facing him before, Earl, he has a real good fastball. He has an outstanding major league fastball. I would say 92, 93 miles an hour. And supposed to have good sinking action. There you can see that fastball tailing back over that outside corner. That's where Whitson's got to keep it if he's to be effective. He's got to keep it down and let, as you mentioned before, Earl and Reggie, let the sinking effect take effect as far as that is pitch is concerned. More of a sinker slider type just outside and there's a bore. Well just add one to Dernier and see Dernier and Sandberg against Wiggins and Gwynn a very interesting stat. 11 to 3, 7 to 2 in run scored. Well, I'll tell you, they have been something. 12 out of 12 out of 19 plate appearances, an outstanding on-base percentage. That's awfully doggone good. You know, 
I know we've talked about this before, but in the first game they had four umpires. I just don't know why they have not gone to six. I just don't think it makes sense. And the first pitch to Sandberg is in and over. So Funny, I guess they're trying to talk, trying to keep a difference between the American League and the National League. They've got six umpires over there, and they've only got four here. Well, so what else is new? They've been doing that, Reggie, for years. It's not sometimes Major League Baseball. It's American League Baseball and National League Baseball when you get right down to it. Yes, it I'll tell you, with Demir and Sandberg getting on base all the time, that pulls the infield in. We've got the shortstop up in double play depth. We've got the second baseman up in double play depth. First baseman has to hold the runner on, and it just makes it tough. To the right side, Wiggins will go to Templeton for one, and that's all they get. That ball not hit hard, hit off the end of the bat, but they get the lead man at second and near, and that will bring on the Sarge, as they call him Gary Matthews. Whitson will not waste any time. I've always maintained that's not a bad theory to have. You're either going to win in a hurry, lose in a hurry, get it and go, and keep the fielders on their toes. And especially if you're throwing strikes. That's right. Stay in the groove. You no, know, I think as a player, you like to play behind a guy that works fast because you're always on your toes, you're always in the game. You have a tendency to work behind a guy, play behind a guy that does not work fast, work slow. You tend to relax a little bit, get back on your heels, consequently you make a bad play or two. So true. As Matthew stands in, he is two for seven in the series. Good game. The count, and there you saw the first one of the evening by Whitson. Well, we saw the tenth man in Chicago. The Cub fans at Wrigley Field, and what a show they put on! And you have to take the tip of the cap to those fans. And here tonight, a sellout crowd at Jack Murphy Stadium. A good breaking pitch by Whitson. The Padres know there's no tomorrow if they don't come out on top tonight. An outstanding slider right there. You're, if the right-handed hitters are going to hit that pitch, they're going to have to go to right field with it. That's what we were talking about. I think, Reggie, you brought that up the other day, those sinker ball pitchers. They like to see the man try and pull. You like to see the right-handers try and pull that pitch and check swing foul away. As Earl was mentioning, you're better off going the other way with a sinker slider type pitcher. You've got to go with the ball. If it's out over the plate, you've got to try to hit that ball to right field. Right now, I'm wondering whether the twilight is going to affect the hitters. Ed Whitson, although he does throw a sinker, he also throws very, very hard. It just would uh, not surprise me at all to know that the hitters may be having trouble picking the ball up right now. Whoop, there goes Sandberg. Well, there's, there's a broken play. <laughs> right there, home plate was umpire. Terry Bovey called time. In a situation like that with a pro umpire, uh, Gary Matthews asked for timeout at the last minute. He didn't get out of the box until the umpire gave him that time, but Woodson was already, Woodson was already on his way to home plate. We get to see it right here. Matthews asked for time. He got it. A lot of pro umpires wouldn't give you time in that situation because the play has always st already started. And Sandberg was going, but not this time. That is fouled right side, backing out of play. You know, I've found in a situation like that, I'm one of the guys that does call time late when I'm in the box, Earl. And if you turn to the umpire and you're emphatic, you, so you holler, time yourself, then it does catch on. But if you lay back and don't say it loud, you will not get time, as you said. Matthews on the year hit 291, 14 home runs, 82 RBIs. Now he gets time again. I really don't think you should be giving him time that late, Reggie. Well, I didn't so. like that one right there. I did not like that one. Whitson is oh, Whitson's, so. Whitson's upset. And so is Kennedy. Kennedy's turning around and saying, what is this? Who's running this? And here comes Dick Williams out. So Whitson, as we mentioned before, working fast. And right away, the Cubs possibly with a little psychological thought here. I think that's part of the game plan. Here we get it again. He's looking over. He stepped out. He's on his way to home plate. I think he was late. I think he called time late. Another thing, you get Dick Williams. You get a little little fire going right here now. You get a chance for the crowd to get excited. So I'm sure that the Padres will use this to their advantage. And now I Jim Fry's will, out. I think this will help the Padres. Well, the man has to tell Jimmy Fry and Gary Matthews, I'll tell you if it's time or not, you're not going to tell me. And I think that's what Dick Williams wanted to find out. I think right now that this is working in the Padres' favor. They haven't had any excitement at all. And right now they're just looking for something to get them going and get some fire, anything to change the pace. Well, when the Padres were loosening up, before the ball game, and the fans start cheering and giving them a hand. The ball players themselves went around and encouraged the fans to make a little noise. Now 
Jimmy Fry has had his say. The count remains at a ball and two strikes to Matthews. There goes the runner up high, throw through, not in time. So Sandberg with a stolen base, and he had an excellent jump. Yep, the book, the scouting reporter, we get to see the jump right here, and we'll see how much he gets, but the scout, the uh, scouting report shows that while Whitson's got a good move to first base, he's slow getting the ball to home plate. He's got that big leg kick, and of course, that is a base stealer's delight right there. And you look at Nettles at third, he's got to keep an eye on Sandberg. He is back quite a ways, and Sandberg got a pretty good jump. Change, hit well left field, hooking down the line and into the corner. It'll be a foul ball. That had home run depth. He got a high change up over the plate. <laughs> we understand Dennis Loon, our producer, has a report that Jimmy Fry was out there arguing that he shouldn't have called time, that it should have been a ball. <laughs> He's well, you... arguing against his own third hitter. <laughs> a 2-2 pitch. Yeah. On the corner, got him looking. <laughs> Whoa. My goodness gracious. Here's the pitch. Get it from a good shot from center field. It's outside when it started, started and further outside when it went by the plate. Well, that's what we've said before. You've got to establish the strike zone. Well, that ball right there looked like it was outside and also might look like it's been a little bit up. Uh, I think uh, the only guy I could give credit on that one right there is uh, Gary Matthews for showing a little class and not turning around and arguing. Here's Leon Durham. There's two gone. Sandberg remaining at second base. Series at 279 on the year, 23 home runs, 96 RBIs. So far this game, it's nothing like yesterday's game when we didn't notice the umpire. We've already had three incidents here in the first half inning. There's a fly, oh, what a catch by Templeton! He takes away a run from the Cubs. The first time in this series, they have not scored in the first inning. And what a job! Ball hit hard by Durham. Look at it again, guys. Here's a great play. He gets a real good jump, follows the ball all the way. Great extension, and look at him stay with the baseball. That's the kind of play they need to get this play up, to get this team up. What a great play, and he hit the ball on the nose. The Cubs are gone. We go to the bottom half of the first no score. Third in left field, Gary Matthews. Matthews out in left. That's Bobby Dernier in center field. And moving across and over to right field, and he's not out there yet. It'll be Keith Moreland. Do not know where Moreland is at as of this moment, but the battery here tonight, it'll be Jody Davis behind the plate and the right-hander, Dennis Eckersley on the mound. Eckersley, 30 years of age, he's a 6'2", 195-pounder, born in Oakland. Traded to the Cubs from the Boston Red Sox was in the Bill Buckner deal. And yesterday was Dennis Eckersley's birthday. And today in St. Louis, Missouri, there's a fan glued to the set who's having her 81st birthday. And that's my mother. Happy birthday, Mom. You told me you were going to get that in. Yes, sir. <laughs> and rightfully so. There's Moreland. Moreland was down in the bullpen, so he moves into right field. Your infield from the left side will be Say and Boa from the right side, Sandberg and Durham. And the outfield from left to right, Matthews, Dernier, and Moreland in the battery of Davis and Eckersley. And it'll be Alan Wiggins to lead it off. He'll be followed by Tony Gwynn and then Steve Garvey. Eckersley, a record of 10 and 8 for the Cubs, but they say he has pitched much, much better than that. Well, there's no secret he, what he throws. It's sinker slider, mostly down, but he works in and out. He's got a good changeup. Eckersley, 8-3 since the All-Star break in his last eight starts. He has given up two earned runs or less. That's low, and the count, 2-0. and all. Dallas Green, again, one of his deals with the Boston Red Sox. 
really had four more or less consecutive mediocre seasons with Boston. There's this track in the count moves to two and one. It seemed like Don his last few years with the Boston Red Sox and he just lost his fastball. But for me, I would just say that Dennis Eckersley lost his confidence. He had a couple of bad years in a row and he, he just had problems believing in himself. And a smile left side. The count will go even at two and two. <laughs> got a new lease on life and he is just tickled to death to be in Chicago. I remember talking to him in the outfield over there a couple of times and he was booed in 1983 and he just just didn't like it. it didn't sit well with it. This will be his first start ever against the Padres so you would have to think that the early advantage would go to Eckersley. Five ball left center field. Bobby Dernier right there. That is one away. I tend to agree with you uh, on that, Donnie. You know, for me as a hitter, I don't like to face a guy that I don't know anything about. I would rather face a fellow that I've faced many times. That way I know what he's going to do to me. I know what to look for, whether he's going to work me fastball, curveball, inside or out. I think it should work to his advantage. Well, with Eckersley on the mound, would you look in or out because he goes both places? Would you just try to think with him on every pitch? Uh, yes, I would, Earl. He tries to stay away from me. That's been his pattern. I faced him seven, eight years. He tried to throw me a breaking ball in the dirt once in a while and stay away with a fastball. Tony Gwynn takes his strike. There you see, since the All-Star break, Eckersley right there with that 2.06 ERA. Hershiser followed by Roden, Thurman, and Gooden. Center field, that's a base hit and maybe more. Junior moving over in a hurry. Quinn on his way for two. The throw going to be close, not a time. I'll tell you, the way Bobby Denier made it a close play, he's going to have to back off. He made an excellent play. His second hit of the series. All right, we get it. The ball's hit real hard. It looks like it might go by for a triple. De Niro off with the crack of the bat, got the ball spun and made a decent throw into second base, and that's a long throw. It didn't look like it was going to be close, and he had one slide. He made a great play just to make it close, Earl. Here's Steve Garvey. One out, one on. There's the breaking pitch for the strike. It surprised me to see Gwen try to steal a base to get something started here. Well, right now, as I said earlier in the show, you got to look for one of the big guys like a Steve Garvey to get the job done to get the Padres on the board early. Breaking pitch outside. Quinn can get a good lead out at second base, and you've got Eckersley with that high leg kick. Well, a lot of times for me, when you see a guy that threw hard for early in his career, all of a sudden they will not be able to go inside or keep the ball away. A guy like Garvey should know this. Top right side. Moving over Durham, over is Davis. Durham calling it's Durham for the catch. Wynn goes halfway and he will hold right there. There was nobody at second base. Cutting fourth. Garvey fouls to Durham, and that'll bring on Greg Nettles. Here's one man in the Padre lineup that does know Eckersley. Yes, he does. He played against him uh, with the Yankees there for several years, and I've seen him hit home runs off Dennis Eckersley, Eckersley to left and to right field. Nettles is a pretty good low ball hitter. 327 down both lines here at Jack Murphy Stadium. 370 to the power alleys. 405 to straightaway center field. They brought the fences in here in San Diego from the spot where they had them when the Padres first came into existence. 0-1 the count to Nettles. It'd be interesting to see to me how they pitch Greg Nettles. Usually when you get older, like a guy like myself, you're 38 years old, Greg Nettles, 39, 40 years old. A lot of times they just try to pump fastballs by it, and uh, sometimes that doesn't work. And the change outside. One ball and one strike to count. The infield, they're deep to the right. The outfield, the same. There you see the defensive alignment say well back and off the line. Over to his left is short. Sandberg out in the grass in right field. Bounce right side. Durham on the big hop. He'll go to the bag and do it himself. And the Padres are retired. No runs on a hit. They leave one and after one. 
from San Diego, there's no... Battle. All right, Timmy, as Keith Moreland leads it off here in the second inning, takes a fastball high, the count 1-0. It'll be Moreland saying Davis. Keith is three for seven in the series with the RBI, as you see right there. And the breaking pitch in and over. That outside part of the plate, and the count goes even at one and one. Well, I've been impressed with Whitson's change and with his uh, breaking ball that he's been able to keep on the outside half of the plate. Push foul right side, and the count one and two. That's a pretty good statistic right there. You see on four days rest, he's been eight and three. And just funny for me how pitchers, statistics just seem to stick with them. They just seem to work well for them. When they're on five days rest, they do certain things. On three days rest, they do others. Do if others. you were in a different sport, uh, that's why they print the racing form. <laughs> <laughs> just outside, Whitson missing with a sinker and the count one and uh, check that two and two. But that's one of the reasons that uh, exactly what you said, why I used him so much when I was managing. Yeah, what, the racing form? Not the racing form. <laughs> <laughs> There's a line drive by Nettles down the left field line. That's going to go for extra bases. Martinez chasing it in the corner, and Moreland goes to second base with a leadoff double. Now, right here, I'd like to say, Moreland, in the first two games, and I'm sure the scouting report says with two strikes, he goes to right field. Whitson tried to go inside with him, he got the bat out in front and hit it down the left field line, which is out of character. Well, a lot of times, Earl, uh, players that are smart, players that study scouting reports, I paid attention to scouting reports a, a great deal during playoffs and World Series times because you definitely can expect the kind of pitches that they say will get you out That's during exactly the playoffs right. and World Series. And I'm sure that Keith Moreland was probably looking for that pitch. There's the change up high to say, hitting 240. Two for six on the year. Say has not had the best record against Whitson. You saw a little bit ago at 133, the breaking pitch outside. Two and all the count. You saw that first pitch by Whitson, that palm ball to the change. He did that, picked up the pitch literally by accident. Clubhouse last year between games by double header, he cut his finger twisting off a bottle cap. Takes a little bit off right there, the breaking pitch. And he couldn't couldn't grip the breaking ball. That game he went nine innings, held the ball between the thumb and the forefingers, and all of a sudden he comes up with a new pitch. Now I would not recommend that for everybody. Donnie, let me ask you this question. Being a big six foot six side armor like you were, I see Ed Whitson leaning over to the side against right handers. I'm sure he's making a tough one. Well, the biggest thing that what you can do right there, Reggie, I always did like Whitson is doing right there, worked off the right hand side of the rubber. I threw a little bit across my body anyway, and then if you try and move that ball over to the outside corner and you have the control out there, it makes it just a little bit tougher if you can maintain that angle. Makes it tougher for the right hand, the right hand hitter. Shoulder in. Controls right -hand the hitter. secret. There's a base hit in the center field. Moreland without a lot of speed. They're going to wave him off. Mick Reynolds throw to the play. Not in time. Moreland scores. One to nothing, Chicago. The center, the center of the cup line up with the San Diego has it. They get the man on second base. Three, four, five, and six have been getting them in. Here we get to see it. It's a pitch that was supposed to get out just a little bit further than it did. Three quarters of the plate, and Say got it. That ball is up and out over the plate, Earl. And there you see deposits in the center field. Well, a good throw, they throw him out. That was not a good throw at all. That no, ball died out there. Well, sometimes when you come up with that ball out of the gloves, you get it cross seam. You don't have time to set it with the pitcher, and it looked like he charged it. He got everything he had behind it, but the ball tailed off on the way into home plate. It was not a good throw. Now, Norm Sherry, the pitching coach, has been out to the mound as he will have that chat with Whitson and automatically work in the bullpen. Here it is again. Look at the throw. We see Kevin McReynolds set himself, unleash the ball. And the throw is just up the line. It's just not a good throw. It's off the mark. And bingo, the Cubs got a run. Here's Jody Davis as he takes a strike with a fastball. Well, both pitches to Moreland and say Whitson got up and he's not going to be effective high. Dravecki and Hawkins in the bullpen, a left-hander and a right-hander right away. As Dick Williams knows, there's no tomorrow. Good change.
two the count. There's talking Dick. the bad situation to be to be in, but you can't mess around now. I was talking to Dick Williams before the game, and he felt it imperative that the Padres get a lead. They have not had a lead in the series. Outside the count, one and two. I gotta believe if I'm Whitson and you have his type of stuff, you gotta be staying down and away a lot more than what he's doing right now. Any success he's had tonight has been down and away. He got hurt right here in this inning. Both pitches were up. Well, he's tried to get down and away. He's missed a number of times. Again, Don, it goes back to that control that you're talking about. If you're ahead, you can afford to be a little bit finer. But when you drop behind, you want that strike, and it just doesn't go where you want it to go. Now the Cubs in scoring in the last two days, they scored first in both first innings. And both times it started off, it was Bobby Dernier. The count remains at a ball and two strikes to Jody Davis. See right there, three or fewer runs at 25 and 31 starts. And he's down one to nothing here tonight. He has pitched well. He has pitched well. a token throw because say isn't going anywhere or at least I wouldn't think he is Jimmy Fry down in that dugout you see Dennis Eckersley grabbing a bat something a little new for Dennis over here in the National League there's a bad change hook foul down in the corner out of play if Jimmy Fry should win this ball game that man right there will be the first man since Alvin Dark to win pennants in both leagues Yogi Berra was another and Joe McCarthy was the other and that's only because there's a ground ball base hit left field so say to second he'll hold right there Martinez gets it back in so Moreland say and Davis with the hits and the Cubs threaten again Don, that's only because Earl Weaver told me earlier today that he has not managed yet in the National League. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And here we get it in super slow motion. Again, you can see him trying to go to the outside half of that plate. We can see it real well there. The ball center of the plate out, but not on the outside corner. And it's driven in the hole in the left field. You know, one thing I wanted to say about Jim Fry, you know, we're talking about him winning a pennant in an American League and National League. He'll be the only man in baseball history ever to do it his first year in the league, managing in the league. That is something, too, as Larry Boa stands in. Offset foul, back and out of play. Now, here's a big man for Woodson because you've got Boa followed by Eckersley and then the leadoff hitter. You almost want to go into Dernier at least with two outs. Boa, switch hitter. Hitting from the left side, indeed they do. That's about a tip foul away. That's unusual there. Is the pitcher coming up? I wouldn't expect Larry Boa to be bunning. I think he might have been trying to catch Nettles back a little bit. The Padres have drawn a million nine hundred eighty-three thousand nine hundred and four. Their biggest record, their all-time record crowd here at Jack Kirby Stadium is 52,134, but that will fall tonight. Yeah, and well, I you wonder about that bunt as the pitch comes in and a pop out to second base, but you wonder why Bo would be bunting in that, in that situation. Bo only has 17 RBIs for the year. He's trying to beat that ball out for a base hit He's, and uh, keep, keep the rally going. I guess they didn't figure as though that that ball was high enough for an infield fly. You thought that all of a sudden Templeton might have been able to let that ball drop. They could have had at least a pair. Well, that's right. Up. And that's amateur umpiring. Now here's Eckersley hitting 109 on the year with an RBI. On deck, Bobby Dernier. The Padres were looking for the bunt, and Eckersley showed no signs of bunting. He had that whole left side open. Now Templeton has got a new sign from the bench as he flashes it on the infield to see exactly what kind of a defensive alignment they want to move. There's a butt attempt that they let it go. They can let it drop it too. How many times do you see that happen? Oh, we worked on that one in spring training. 
you work on it, you work on it, and finally the situation happens where if the pitcher lets the ball hit the ground, he can go to second, to first, to double play. Invariably, the player will forget to catch the ball. Well, right there, if you let Greg Nettles catch that ball, then I'm sure that Greg is thinking to let this ball drop. But Whit's number number excited. He Mark wants to get the out. So there you can see him grab the ball. Greg Nettles laying back. And he looked like he wanted to let the ball drop. Well, you know Greg wanted to let it drop. And then all of a sudden after that, he's just going to get out of the way and not interfere with him. And boy, you see that happen not only here, but so many times throughout the course of the year. Bobby Dernier takes a strike and the count is on one. One to nothing. And the Cubs are on top. Mr. Whitson, Mr. Whitson can make it all academic right now. He'll just go after this hitter. But I'll guarantee you, Dick Williams is saying we worked on that spring play and spring training also. He's wondering why they didn't let it drop. Outside, the breaking pitch, one and one to count. Both pitchers are ready in the bullpen. One ball and one strike, and you have Ryan Sandberg on deck. Already has thrown 40 pitches. There's a change and a line drive. Soft line to the Templeton, and that'll do it. From the side, retired. But the Cubs come up with a run on three. Hence, they leave a pair. After one and a half, they lead it one to nothing. Nebraska, and of course, Oklahoma State, and Georgia and Alabama right here on ABC. And you see the shot. From the Goodyear Blimp, Columbia, from Torrance, California, the pilot is Captain John Creighton from Hermosa Beach. Our cameraman up there tonight is Arch Griffin. As we go to the bottom of the second inning, and it will be Terry Kennedy to lead it off. Kennedy takes a strike, 0-1 the count. He has taken the collar in the series, as you see, 0 for 7. It'll be interesting to see, see to me how he works, Kennedy. Eckersley has trouble with left handers throwing the ball inside, and Kennedy likes the ball away. Kennedy yesterday in that final out of the ball game with Lee Smith. Of course, Smith can supply a lot of power himself. There he just reached out. There's another change out there. One and two to the count and just kind of laid the bat on the ball and took Cotto right to the wall. You think, what if he'd have turned it loose a little bit? What might have happened? The Reds, the first three pitches were outside. Out of play and the count remains at a ball and two strike. And he might have tried to go in there, but it was more center of the plate. Exactly. Boy, they're right there. He's got to get that bat going if they're going to do anything. Seven of his last 11 starts. He is with the one collar. of the keys, Donnie. He's one of the keys. There's a one-hopper hit the ball. Routine play for the veteran shortstop, and he throws him out. has told us before uh, the series started was that they're not a spectacular defensive club but they get the sure routes and so far in this series that's what they've done they've been sure on almost all the balls hit to them I know when I played with the Yankees we had a man over there named Bucky Dent didn't have great range didn't make spectacular plays but every out to him was an out Here's Kevin McReynolds and he hits it off the end of the bat to the right side there's Sandberg and there's two gone that's what I always feel defensively is the important thing. Make your outs, outs. Don't give teams four outs in an inning or five outs in an inning. Exactly. You can't give Major League clubs that many outs without getting hurt. Spectacular play is neat to look at, but just let my outs be outs. And if you don't do that, you get to the big part of that lineup too often. Here's Carmelo Martinez. Two for seven in the series. On the year, he hit 250, 13 home runs and 66 RBI. Lights are on here at Jack Murphy Stadium and starting to take effect a little bit. Eckersley missing outside the count 1 0. Boy, if that isn't beautiful. That is absolutely gorgeous as you look out towards the Pacific. Change is high, the count 2 0. out of play. Well, the roar in the background as the San Diego chicken has come out to try <laughs> is that the San Diego chicken or is that the man that knows he's got tickets in the front row? Oh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> is that Euchre? <laughs> I don't know. Of course, I've seen him like that a few times. <laughs> that, 
Martinez on the right side foul. Well, we talked at the hotel today about San Diego looking flat. When a team is not producing offensively, they're going to look bad. There, there's nobody stealing a base. There's nobody going from first to third. You're not getting back to back to back singles. And uh, you're just not yourself when you're not producing offensively. That's true. When you're not on the bases, not running around and not sliding, it just looks like you're flat. Whether you're flat or not, that's how it's going to look. Earl, I don't know about you, but I sure like this guy's stance, Carmelo Martinez. He's got a real aggressive, powerful looking stance. And he's a strong fella. Inside, the count goes full of three and two, and on deck, Gary Templeton. Dave Davis trying to work a little bit and yank that back in. That's hit the left field, down the line, moving back is Matthews, still to the wall, still to the wall, he's there to make the catch. Where was that one in Wrigley? Gone, maybe. The wind's blowing out, so we're through two, one to nothing, Chicago. All right, Timmy, thank you very much, and the count 0-2 to the leadoff hitter, Ryan Sandberg. Bill Giles was an honest man when he, when he said he wished he wouldn't have made a couple of those trades, but they had their year last year. They won the National League pennant. Well, we're going to have to check on that last deal to see which it was with the Phillies and the Cubs. I'm trying to think of that. That might have been the Matthews Dernier deal. That was it. That was it. I think there's a lot of teams could have won that division or any division if they'd have had Sutcliffe and Eckersley. Way outside the count one and two. You get two guys that go 26 and nine for you. I think there's a lot of teams that could have won it. And Eckersley pitched in tough luck all year. Two balls and two strikes to count. And this is one of the former Phillies right here. Young man who's having himself quite a year, does not get the breaking pitch, and is down on strikes. Breaking ball 3-2 with a little bit off of it. That's the way you win ball games. Here's we get a look at the pitch again as Big Ed Whitson comes around over the top this time. You can see the rotation of that baseball. Almost looks like the bottom falls out of that ball as he swings and misses. Here's Gary Matthews. Sends it high, right side foul. Garvey moving over right to the box seat railing and fighting the tarp can't get it. You know, there's been a lot of trades really over the years. You take people like Frank Robinson, and, and when I left the Yankees the first year I was in Diana, I made 39 home runs, but I think it's over the long haul that people like that make trades, and to go on and blast the guy, I remember when they traded, traded Jack Stanford a long time ago over to the San Francisco Giants from the Phillies. He had a great year as well, won over 20 ball games. Sometimes an organization is just strong in one position, and there's not much you can do about it. You can only option them back four times. He got away with a high fastball right there. This is not the first time it'll happen to an organization, and it won't be the last. Look at all the people that Baltimore got in 1976 from the Yankees. Yes, they still got starters from that place. And yet, it helped the Yankees uh, win the division uh, that particular year that the trade was made. Just outside. A little high. One and two to count. Getting back to that trade, it's Tippy Martinez. Rick Dempsey, Scott, and Scott McGregor. McGregor, and you've forgotten who went over to the Yankees, uh, but they helped them win, 1976. Out of play, right side, the count remains at a ball and two strikes. There's one out. We're in the top of the third, and the Cubs on top, one to nothing. Boy, you talk about irony. As far as Chicago is concerned, they've won 98 games this year, including the two postseason games. Cubs team to win more or to win more than 98 games in one season were the 1945 Cubs. They won 98 regular season games and three in the World Series. First they came up one short to the Tigers. High three and two. Are you trying to say that this is the year of the Cubs? Boy, I'll tell you, they have had so many things going their way and you just got to take your cap off to them. They really have had a great year. Watch him. Well, Whitson had him 0-2 and loses him. Last two hitters, 3-2. and two. Got one, lost the other one. You never know. You never know. Never, it's never over until it's over. Remember in 1982? 
over there in Milwaukee. Yes, no, I do. The Angels leading three to two, leading two games to nothing. We go in there, and again, in the seventh or eighth inning, we were still leading that ball game. Had a chance to go to the World Series. It was taken right out, just snapped right out of the cupboard. Leon Durham. Cecil Cooper with a base hit, and all of a sudden, we go home. Well, you saw that. Only three walks in the last six starts, and of course, he's walked two already here tonight as Leon Durham stands in high. Shallow center. McReynolds, lots of room. Two gone. Leon Durham, one of the very good low ball hitters in baseball, just popped up that high fastball, let her out. You know, the thing about Leon Durham, he's a little bit aggressive right now, maybe a little bit too aggressive, as we see the pitch from Ed Whitson. He goes after a ball that's really not his pitch. That ball is up and out of the strike zone. A low ball hitter. Right a little there. bit too excited right he's now, I think, maybe. Oh, yes. They get anxious. Here's Keith Moreland. He led off the second inning with a double. Eventually scored on the base hit by Ron Say. Say driving in his third RBI of the championship series. And that's where we stand. One to nothing Chicago. The breaking pitch down and away. Boy, I'll tell you, that is absolutely beautiful. Just beautiful. Gary Matthews gave, gave indications that he might be running. got picked off. He, he was going on either one of those pitches if he could get a jump. Well, they're almost almost only counts in horseshoes. An accident. Well, Matthews had 17 stolen bases on the year, so indeed you do have to keep an eye on him. Almost picked him off, but they say to get as much lead as you possibly can, and that's just about what he's got. Well, he was on his way to second base. There's the strike to Moreland. One and one to count. Right. Right now, Keith Moreland's got the swing that I like to have. In the last eight at-bats, he's hit the ball in the air seven times. That's the swing I look for in the second half of the season. <laughs> That's fouled right side. The count moves on to one and two. Well, it appears that we've seen a go-around as far as the Cubs are concerned in the lineup. The Padres have two more men to go, Templeton and Whitson. And home plate umpire, Terry Vogley. He's Evidently settled in on the strike zone. The players have settled in themselves. It was a tough first inning. Of course, Matthews caused a lot of it by backing out of that box. Out in front, Kennedy out in a hurry and makes the play to Garvey. That'll do it for the Cubs in the third. Bill Giles, in our recent conversation with him, said that the most damaging trade that they made was the Dernier and Matthews trade. Do you agree with that? Well, it helped us uh, considerably get out, getting out of the chute, uh, Timmy. Uh, we had a lousy spring training. We had to get something to juice us up. Matthews and Denier did that for us. And what about the uh, the pitchers that are concerned with this ball club? Not too bad a staff. Well, we we got those done a little later. Uh, we had to trade Buckner and some kids away to do it. But we got Eckersley and Sutcliffe and Frazier and and uh, Stoddard, and we got the job done. Do you feel like you picked your ex-boss's pocket? <laughs> We, we, uh, we have a good rapport with Philadelphia. I know those guys, and I knew that they weren't going to be able to use the near, and I thought that Matthews uh, might be available because he had had some contract problems. Dallas Green, general manager of the Chicago Cubs. Thank you very much, Steve. Now let's go back to the booth to Don Drysdale. All right, thank you very much, Timmy. And Dallas, as the count is two and two to the leadoff hitter here in the bottom of the third, Gary Templeton, as they get the wave moving around here in San Diego. Boy, they've got a full house. They can get it rocking. One to nothing, the Cubs on top. A run on three hits for Chicago. No runs on one hit for San Diego. Out of play, left side. The count remains 2-2. Two -two. Well, that rapport between Dallas Green and Philadelphia will continue, but the trades won't. I can bet on that. The <laughs> trades will not so. continue. No. No. Really? No. You'd have to put a... A 30 at the bottom of that, a final, end of score. <laughs> That's the left field, and giving ground is Matthews, but he'll have a play, and there's one away. And that'll bring on the pitcher, Ed Whitson. I think that sooner or later, the Padres are going to have to get something going. Whitson is doing a job right now. He has slowed the Cubs down. They've only got one run. Uh, the Pud Padres have to get something going. I don't care if it's a base on balls or get a man on base with an arrow, steal second or something. They've got to get some movement. Well, you know, you just heard from Dallas Green with our colleague Tim McCarver, and I'll tell you something that is absolutely amazing when you think about this. 
Lee Smith and Henry Cotto are the only players signed and developed in the Cubs farm system. Amazingly, 20 on this 25-man roster were acquired by trades, and eight of them were former Phillies. How to play right side very quickly, 0-2. I'll tell you, Don, I've played for quite a few ball, ball clubs like that. That's the thing of beauty right there, huh? I've played for quite a few clubs. Uh, the Yankees, the California Angels, that have put a lot of different ball players together, and they've won. I wanted to the count to Whitson on deck is Alan Wiggins. It doesn't make much, uh, a lot of difference how you acquire the players as long as you've got <laughs> enough of them on the field that can do the job. <laughs> Inside, two and two, the count. As the wave moves on, the lower deck to the loads deck to the top deck, all the way around Jack Murphy Stadium. Oh, what a path that has become. Off the end of the bat, Ron say to his left. On across to Durham, and there's two gone. In the meantime, the Cubs are on top, one to nothing. Fans feel like you do, Reggie. They've got to get some of the money. Exactly. They've, They've got, got to get, get going in a hurry. And maybe that's one of the reasons for the way. I don't know. You know, sometimes I think this year when I've been hitting and been at the plate, I've wondered about the wave. It kind of distracted me, to be very honest with you. You like to see the fans get involved, and you certainly do want them to help you because you, I do believe that they can. But I think it distracted me once or twice. I'm not big on it when I'm hitting. Here's Wiggins as he checks the bunt, takes low. I've often wondered about that because I've had something similar to that as before the wave ever came in. But about the pitcher standing back there, and all of a sudden when you throw and release about the time they come up from behind home plate trying to pick that ball up, a bunt. And that's I don't know if they, they won't get, it, they won't they get anybody. That's exactly what they need. Perfectly executed. Once it got by Eckersley and Durham had to make the play. No chance. What a perfect punt. We see it high here from the third base side. Put in a perfect spot. There's nobody that can get the first base quicker. Right now, Wiggins can now. Once he got that ball down where he can. You know, Dick Williams made a big point before the ball game. I almost thought it was unfair of him to say it, but he felt that Gwynn and Wiggins had to get on base. Well, they've, they've got, got some Wiggins there. Now. They've got Wiggins there, and he'll be standing on second as quickly as he possibly can because he's going to try to run. Well, watch the high leg kick of Eckersley and see if he tries to counter in any way. There's that little just short toss. He never did before in the American League. Tony Gwynn has hit 413 when Tony, when Alan Wiggins has been on base. And the very big reason for that is because he can hit anybody's fastball and to try to throw a base runner out at second base, you're going to get a lot of fastballs. You would have to think that, boy, you think that isn't a delight for a second place hitter. Well, that's true. And sometimes sitting in the dugout when I was managing, I'd almost say to myself, let him go and get your hitter out. There's two outs. You, you'd want to say that. It's not the right thing to say, but I, I said it to myself a million times. And we can see Dennison going over to first base time after time. You know that uh, Wiggins is on his mind. Well, Wiggins at first, and here's what Alan Wiggins had to say about running on Dennis Eckersley. Uh, from what I understand, Eckersley comes from the side, so he's got to get a little action on his uh, motion. So uh, he's going to be uh, a little easier than Sutcliffe to run on. Again, and Deckersley certainly aware of that. Yes, that's why you see so many throws over there at the first base. He knows he doesn't have a great move. He knows he has the high leg kick to be effective. Um, so he's going to try to keep Allen Wiggins over there as close as he possibly can. Say up at the edge of the grass at third. And again, he goes over there. And the thing right here, Earl, if you're sitting there and you're a manager, you're hoping, I would think, that Wiggins goes as quick as he can. Get him off of the pitcher's mind. Don't let him disturb all of your concentration. Right. And if you're Dick Williams, you want him to stay over there. No, he's going to let him go, Reg. <laughs> you see Gwynn thinking he might go, too. I think it'll take a little load off of Gwynn's shoulders when you get a man over there like that. Well, well Wiggins is going to go when he gets the jump. He's going to go when he, he feels like he can make it and not until then. Want to know what makes base, baseball great, that's for sure, Donnie. Well, I think what he might have wanted to do right there is take a look at one pitch. There he goes, a little late jump. The throw, got him! A late jump by Wiggins. He did not get 
did a good jump at all, and Jody Davis had it on the money. All right, we get the jump. I'll tell you, Dennis Eckersley didn't worry about it to the hitter. He cut that leg kick down, and as a result, Wiggins wasn't going. He slides into second base. A perfect throw. He tags him out. We'll One be back. In Chicago. As Ron Say takes down low, they appeal. They say no. Well, that's the first appeal that we've seen in this series, I believe. I don't remember any. And I don't think he, he's, he swung at the ball. We'll have to see. Went out after, but didn't go across the plate. 2 0 the count to say. Had the base hit after the double by Moreland in the second inning to put the Cubs on top 1 to nothing, and that's where we stand. On deck, Jody Davis. Top right side. Garvey will have a play in foul territory. Out number one. Reminder that the National League Championship Series and ABC Sports Exclusive is being brought to you by Bud Light. For all you do, this Bud's for you. One away to Jody Davis, single in the hole between third and short, his first time at bat. The catcher, Jody Davis. The Cubs with three hits and the Padres with two. Davis having a good series, and I, as far as I can remember, that was the first man thrown out stealing in the series. Have not been a lot of attempts, really. Hey, he has really improved in his throwing and his all-around defense. He's digging more balls out of the dirt. They just feel on the Cubs that he's a lot more relaxed. That Johnny Oates has helped him considerably. He just threw that ball by him. Oh, and to the count. Oates has spent hours and hours studying videotape isolation plays of Davis in his throwing. And it's helped. There's no question about that. Foul right side, 0 2 the count. Every game they'll go over the hitters. Oates, Davis, and that day's starter. And they've got the job done. I'll say that for them. Johnny Oates is an intelligent man. He came through the Baltimore Oriole organization as a minor leaguer. A great person. Good breaking pitch, and Davis is gone. Got got that big sidearm motion right now. Big step out to the side. He's really throwing the ball well and it's working real good for him. Well, that'll be coming your way this Saturday on ABC. You'll see either the Cornhuskers of Nebraska and the Oklahoma State Cowboys have a 4-0 record or the battle of the stop. SEC rivals Georgia Larry and Bowles. Alabama. And of course, a week from Saturday, the number one ranked Texas Longhorns battle the number three Oklahoma Sooners. Right here on ABC at 3.30 Eastern Time. High power. Wiggins says he'll take it. And Templeton moves alongside. He makes the catch, and Boa retired. The Cubs are going into fourth. No runs, no hit. There's another one from our Goodyear blimp. A full house right here at Jack Murphy Stadium in San Diego. A beautiful complex. The Cubs on top, one to nothing, and we're in the bottom of the fourth inning. And it'll be Tony Gwynn, who was at bat when Wiggins was cut down, trying to steal to end the third. Gwynn, Garvey, and Nettle. Outstanding hitter right here, 351, 213 base hits. He's got great quickness. I mentioned the other day on the telecast, he was a 32 and a half inch, 31 ounce bat. And I don't know anyone using a smaller bat than that. Lengthwise, anyway. Over the outside corner, 0 1. He doubled up the alley in right center field his first time at bat. Slight breeze blowing out. Luke Powell left side, and Eckersley's out in front, 0-2. He is a Rod Carew type, a Cecil Cooper type, not quite as much power, a George Brett type. He uses the whole diamond. So if you're a young fellow, as we look at his wife, Alicia, if you're a young fellow watching this ball game and you want to pat on yourself after a good hitter, this is the man to look at. He really dives into the ball. Well, he uses the entire yard, as we say. Excellent basketball player at San Diego State. His brother was on the U.S. Olympic baseball team inside. That will back him off of there. As I said, he's been diving into that ball, and there's no doubt, there's no doubt that Dennis Eckersley's going to go in if he possibly can, and he got this one too far in. Now that that here's the real. We get the action of Alicia. Oh, my goodness, it almost hit him. But that's what Eckersley's going to do. If you start diving into that plate, he's going to move you off of it. Pull to the right side and through by Sandberg. <laughs> I 
Yeah, that'll, that'll bring a di different reaction from Alicia, I'm sure. There it is. You know, that pitch right there, he tried to get that ball inside the same way he threw the other pitch way inside. Jody Davis was sitting on the inside corner, and he mashed it through the right side of the diamond. Quickness. There it is. Mashes that ball right by Ryan Sandberg. Well, that ball just picked up speed going through there. <laughs> something to laugh about now as Steve Garvey stands in. He fouled the first. 0 for 1. 1 to nothing. Cubs on top. Win with good speed also. He has 33 stolen bases on the year. 1-2 hitters have been on 3 out of 4 times tonight. Now it's up to the center of the lineup. The big guys like you said, Rex. <laughs> well, that's exactly right, Earl. They've got to get the job done. The Whitman's doing a good job holding the, holding the offense down of the Chicago Cubs. The offense of the Padres has got to put some numbers on the board. And it was Jimmy Fry who might have been thinking, well, they're not doing it with the bats. They're not moving people around that way. Maybe Dick Williams will try and move the runner with a hit and run situation. Garvey goes that way well, and Jody Davis pitching out. 1 0 the count. And it's 2 0. Another term throughout the first two, uh, two ball games is when. San Diego did get something started. They hit the ball hard, but it was hit right at somebody for a double play. 2-0 oh the count. On deck, Greg Nettles. This is a great spot to hit in. Two balls and no strikes. I'm sure that Steve Garvey, Steve Garvey, Steve Garvey, <laughs> get it out of here. I'm sure that Steve Garvey's looking for a fastball to work with. And I wouldn't want my runner to run on this pitch. Let Garvey get his pitch and let him swing as hard as he wants to. The 2-0 pitch to Garvey. Off the end of the bat, could be two. Boa to Sandberg for one. And they turn it over, the double play. So they went to the 2-0 breaking pitch, and Garvey hit it off the end of the bat. It's amazing how many good pitches the cup, uh, the cup pitchers have made when they're behind. He hit the ball hard, but here again, it didn't find a hole right at Boa. I don't think he really hit this ball hard, Earl. Right now. Well, it was hit hard enough so that Garvey's not even in the picture yet. Sure. Now, very quickly, two gone, as that settles the crowd down just a little bit. And it'll bring on Greg Nettles. High to right center. Nobody sees it. Dernier didn't see it. Moreland didn't see it. Now Dernier sees it and makes a catch. Both of them stood there with their arms out. They could not see it. So the Padres are gone in the fourth, and we're through four. One to nothing, Chicago. On the fly ball that Greg Nettles hit the center field, you see Moreland. He can't see the ball. Now we go back to Denier. He can't see it. He then finally keeps his eye on it, gets a bead, and he picks up the baseball and gets the out. I'll tell you, it's about a quarter to seven out here now in California. It's twilight, and it's a little tough to see when you're an outfielder. This is the toughest time to play in when the ball goes up in the air. You can see the twilight. It'll be dark in 10 or 50 hours, well, even less than that. We'll say five minutes, and the ball won't be quite as hard to see for the outfielders. And very quickly, it is 0-2 to Dennis Eckersley. On deck, the leadoff hitter, Bobby Denier, and then Ryan Sandberg. Yes, Eckersley is down on strike. four for Whitson. We go to the top of the order in Dernier. I don't care if that was a pitcher or not. There were three pretty good pitches. Well, there's, the, there's a tough spot Bob looking out west out there, there Reggie. Just right now, that ball is just about the same color as the sky, yep. and that's what makes it so tough to pick up. I know one of the reasons that I use the black bat. Willie Randolph told me that at night, and especially in twilight, it's tough to see the ball come off the bat. I thought it gave me an advantage. That's why Reggie Jackson uses it like that. Happy door. That's the first time I ever heard that. Yeah. Willie Randolph, ask any of your infielders. Willie Randolph, when I was with the Yankees, told me it's tough to pick the ball up off a black bat. Dernier to the right side. There's Wiggins. On to Garvey, two goal. I always thought it made sense. It's a little tough to see that black bat coming through there at nighttime. Ryan Sandberg. Well, there you see the players that have been acquired for the Philadelphia Phillies. Bo Dernier, Matthews, Moreland, Ruthman, and Sandberg. And you've got everybody in the lineup tonight except Ruthman. He's a pitcher. Five of them. Ryan Sandberg, 0 for 2 tonight. Not in a fielder's choice. He's stolen a base and he struck out. That change, Woodson has made a couple of mistakes inside. 
continued to be impressed with the way he's pitched tonight, though. I agree he with you, Earl. He Both is doing pitch. his part, Donnie. Both pitchers have They've been pitching well as Hedberg takes the strike. One and one to count. Yeah, they have praised this man, Ryan Steinberg, all year long. I have only had a chance to see him on television, but he sure has shown me an awful lot. Oh, he can he's... run, he can throw, he can hit for power, and he can field. He can do everything. Well, the funny thing about that Philadelphia trade, Sandberg was really not that well-known. Dallas Green doing. They wanted a Guayo, but they were rejected. That's the center field. McReynolds is there, and that will do it. No runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left. And we're through four and a half at the halfway point. The Cubs on top, one to nothing. We go to the bottom of the fifth inning. Kennedy to lead it off. Takes down and away. Want to know the count. Bounce to short his first time at bat. Inside 2-0. Oh. Kennedy didn't have a, a, a good year, but they have to count on him. He was part of their offense, and uh, he's 0 for 8 in the series up to now. Well, if he's going to do anything, Earl, I think he's got to do it against Eckersley here because he's pitching him right where he wants the baseball. There's the ball inside. And a base hit to the hole right that's, side. That's so one the, of the first balls he's pulled to right field. He's been hitting the ball to left field. Dennis Eckersley changed his pattern, and it says on the scouting report that Eckersley does not have success throwing the ball inside the left-hand hitter. A lot of times from the angle that Eckersley will come from, coming strictly from the side, Reggie, as you well know, and that ball is tailing all the time, it's going to tail back over the plate to where the hitter can get the bat on the ball. Exactly. It is much easier to follow the baseball from a sidearm right-hander when you're a left-hand hitter. Here's Kevin McReynolds bounce to second his first time at bat. Takes his strike, and we get some action to get on the Padre bullpen as Dick Williams is thinking down the line. He might need a pinch hitter as Dave Drevecki gets up and starts to throw again. And boy, would it be tough to have to take Ed Whitson out of this ball game. This young man right here, as you look at Drevecki in the bullpen, 0 for 5 on the series. It's one, the one decision you wouldn't have to make in the American League, but Dick Williams right now is he wants that run in before he gets down to that number nine spot in the lineup. Then he can leave him in. Right through the wicket. As Kennedy goes to second, he'll stop right there. Looked over at Ozzie Virgil, and Virgil very quickly held the hands up and said, no, sir, not with Dernier out in center field. As Earl said earlier, the Padres need base hit, base hit, base hit in a row, and here's an opportunity for it. There's a ball right between his leg, right between the pearly gate. And a little bit of managerial strategy coming up here. If I'm managing, I don't want to sacrifice here, and it's not because I don't like the bunt. But I want to get that run in so I can leave my pitcher in the game. I'd try to let Martinez or Templeton drive him in. Going through the signs to Sandberg, Say, and his infielders, letting them know what defensive play that they want to use in case of a bunt. Almost all clubs now have three different things they'll do. There's Frazier warming up the bullpen for the Cubs, but they've got one where the third baseman will charge. They've got one where the first baseman will charge. They've got one where both the third baseman and first baseman will charge. But again, if I were Dick Williams, I'd want that run in so I could leave Whitson in the ball game. Here's Martinez fly deep to left. This first time at bat, he's going to bunt and fouls it away. There's the play there where the third baseman covers the bunt, the shortstop goes to second, the second baseman covers first, and the first baseman charges, and they've got others. In that, the pitcher is supposed to take care of the territory between the mound and third base. We'll see what they put on right now. Oh, and one the count. Well, Dick Williams, too, Earl could be thinking, he says, we've, the Cubs have never been headed. We haven't even been even except from the first pitch. First inning. We'll see what here he wants to do Durham. here. Here comes Durham. A little looper, and there's the infield fly. Sandberg will take it, and that is out number one. Now 
you've got a load of potatoes on the back of Gary Templeton. That's a tough one there right there. Carmelo Martinez really did not do the job. He did not advance the runners. He's got to hit that ball, ground ball to the right side of the diamond. Or if it's going to be a fly ball, it's got to be deep enough to advance those runners in the scoring position so that you have those seven chances in order to get a run home from third base with one out. He did not have a real good swing at that pitch at all. Here's Templeton. Gary fly to left his first time at bat. That's it up the alley, left center field, and they're in a hurry. He can't get it, it'll go to the wall. Here comes Kennedy. Here comes McReynolds. No throw. Padres lead it to the one in a double by Templeton. single his last time at bat. Now Allen will just back out and just collect himself a little bit. This crowd has come alive. Two runs, six hits, no errors for the Padres. A run on three hits, no errors for the Cubs. Takes a strike and a count on one. So a lot of times they talk about crowds should wake up, crowds should come to the ballpark. There's only one way to put people in the ballpark and only one way to make it excited. you got to win to put people in the park. And you got to do something to make them excited. That's exactly right. And this is the first time in the series that San Diego has gotten three hits in one inning. Kennedy led off with a single to right. McReynolds hit a line drive single back to the legs of Eckersley. Martinez popped his second. Templeton doubled up the alley in left center. There's a base hit center field. Here comes Templeton around third or near. Good arm throw off. Cut off by Durham. Back to Sandberg. They get him, but the run score. And it's 3-1 to one, San Diego. Notice the important thing right there. You saw Gary Templeton continuing to run home because if he does not cross home plate before they tag the runner out of second base, he does not score. Here's the pitch. Smacked in the center field. The line drives. Veneer charges hard. Comes up throwing. Makes a good quick throw. It's offline. Templeton hustles all the way over and now the players out but it doesn't matter and it's three to one the Padres will be back after this word we take a look at the play again Alan Wiggins singles sharply to center field Bobby Denier makes a good great charge and a good throw cut off by Durham the important thing there Gary Templeton kept running to make sure that he crossed that plate 
before Bobby Denier was tagged, before Alan Wiggins was tagged out. Exactly, and right there, Gary Matthews jumped on the first pitch and lines at the left, and the Cubs are trying to fight their way back. Three to one, the Padres on top. And yes. something else about the last play of the last half inning. The Cubs got themselves out of that inning without having to get a man out at home plate. They took the sure out at second base. Here's Leon Durham, and you get action in the bullpen for the Padres. There's a strike, and the count is 0-1. So the leadoff single by Matthews. Durham is 0-2. Is lined to short, and he's fly to center. Durham so far has not been patient in this series. He's been swinging at balls that just aren't his. Ooh, are not in his zone. That one was. That one was, and he hooked it foul. Boy, he's got a big hole to shoot through on that right side. He's been pulling that ball a lot to the right side. Hit a few balls, about three or four, five to the opposite field. Kennedy didn't like that pitch by Whitson. He walked out in front of home plate. I think he's telling him to get that ball on the outside half of the plate. Oh, and two the count. Should be two. Wiggins to Templeton for one, and they double him up. play today. He's got fire in his eyes. Well, I'll tell you, he got Matthews down in a hurry at second base, and with his arm, you don't want to stand there and challenge that little white pill. There's Keith Moreland. He has put the Cubs on the board. A leadoff double in the second inning. Scored on a single by Say. That's when the Cubs bunched three of their base hit. The double by Moreland, a single by Say, and a single by Davis. There's the strike, and the count is 0-1. when a pitcher's confident you see him start that hitter off with a breaking ball there you could see what Kennedy and Whitson looking into Kennedy saying what did I do get out in here too much Kennedy saying yeah get up on top and make that breaking pitch just get it down a little bit I'm sure also done what they're thinking right now if they can just get to the seventh inning they know they got the big guy in the pen Foul right side you know when I played against Gossage, Gossage when you had a guy like a Gossage on your team when you had a guy like Raleigh Fingers on your team, you knew that when you went out on the field in the seventh inning with a lead, you knew whether you played against him or whether you had him on your team that you were going to win that ball game. And there he is, standing in the bullpen waiting for his chance. Checked on his swing, they appeal, they call him out, and Marlin throws a bat in the gap. Oh, boy, is he lucky because he would not be around with the regular umpires intact. And here comes Jimmy Fry out. He can't I think that the umpires are aware of that. I think the regular umpires are aware of that kind of thing. The side retired as Fry goes back. We go to the bottom of the sixth inning and the Padres on top, three to one. Good low outside breaking pitch. Marlins bat goes across the plate. Now there's going to be a, an appeal. The appeal down to first base, the call on strike three, the throwing of the bat, and sometimes that earns you an early exit. And Tony Gwynn will lead it off here in the bottom of the inning for the Padres. It's the bottom of the sixth. The Padres on top, three to one. On the corner, and the count of ball and a strike. Well, Dick Williams came out and talked to the home plate umpire. Earl, what do you think was on his mind? Well, Fry went down to the first base umpire. He, he gave an appeal, and if the rules is in uh, the regular season, you cannot appeal a ball and strike out of the dugout. And I think Dick Williams won the Fry ejected from the ball game. Very much so, and it very easily. He's talking to Ed Vargo over there now. There's Eddie Vargo, one of the National League supervisors, and they're going to might make an appeal right here. Williams is after Vargo. There's a base hit left field. tell you you know it wasn't going to last for long anybody that's hitting 350 351 this man came into the ball game with one base hit you know that's not going to last very long he's hit the ball on the nose three times and here's Mr. Garvey Garvey tonight has fouled the first and hit into a double play and 
he would like to say hello to his two beautiful girls, Trisha and Whitney, in New York. Daddy yes. says hi. Daddy would like to do something for you tonight. Well, that's exactly right. Now, Gwynn's at first. Nobody out. 3-8-0 no for the Padres. 1-4-0 for the Cubs. There goes the runner. Bouncer right side. Sandberg over. Now they go back to first, and they make the play. If Gwynn keeps going, he might go all the way to third. That ball just was not hit hard enough. Well, it was an outstanding play by Sandberg. He was on his way to cover second base when Gwynn took off. Sandberg had to get... Sandberg, well, you'll see... Is on his way to cover second base. The hole's wide open. He recovers. He comes back. He gets it. And if, if, if Quinn would have kept going, he could have went to third base on the play. He may have thrown him out as well. You know, on that particular play, Quinn had such a big jump, I'd have liked to see Steve hold the bat and not swing. Nettles takes outside and the count 1-0. Oh. There was no way that Jody Davis was going to throw Tony Gwynn at that time. He had a four or five step, step jump before the ball got to the catcher. Action in both bullpens. Frazier up for the Cubs. Gossage up for the Padres. I agree with you on the last play, Reggie, but how quick can you think of it? Base hit, left center field. That will score Gwynn. Nettles around first. He'll hold right there. It is 4-1 San Diego. Jimmy Fry making his way to the mound. Frazier has been up for the second inning in a row, and right now, let's go down to our colleague, Tim McCarver. All right, Don Drysdale, as you can see, George Frazier is the pitcher. Coming into this series, the only problem that the Cubs had was their inability to bring in a left-handed reliever when he got into trouble, when the starter got into trouble. And now, of course, Greg Nettles and Terry Kennedy are the two left-handed hitters to the problem. We'll be back with more in the sixth inning here. Padres up. This is Mr. Goodwrench. Did you know the spark plugs in your GM car are good? But, uh... He's got a good breaking ball, a real good sinker, and a good hard fastball. He's got all good stuff, but he's always behind 2-0, and oh, it seems like. Nettles at first, and with that RBI, he ties our colleague. That is fouled away. Career RBIs in League Championship Series. That was RBI number 18. Ties him with the man to my right, Mr. Reggie Jackson. I tip my cap to him. Congratulations, Greg Nettles. There you see Nettles Jackson Garvey. Say, Brett Matthews. Pretty good hitters in that group. I'll say that. Two balls and a strike. One after a bad pitch, and it's two and two. Four to one, the Padres on top. And they don't look flat anymore, not when that ball's sailing <laughs> into the outfield. We get the report that Dick Williams indeed was exactly what you were talking about, Earl. He wanted Fry ejected from the ball game. There's a shot. Ball can't get it. Jardier up in a hurry. Nettles will stop at second base, and Kennedy's aboard with his second base hit of the night. And it'll bring on Kevin McReynolds. San Diego ball club was just too good to life one for that long of time and not bust loose before it was over. Well, it's just funny that you look them over in Chicago, they lose a ball game 13 to nothing, they lose another one 4 to 2, and really, when they lost the game 4 to 2, it looked like they lost it 9 to 2, and they lost it so, so one-sided, but now all of a sudden, 24 hours later, maybe even a little less time than 24 hours, they are now a team that has got a lot of fire, they're rolling high, they're riding high. The fans are behind them, and it looks like a whole different ball club. 58,346, the largest crowd ever for Major League Baseball here at Jack Murphy Stadium. And that is a packed house. And you can see the determination on the San Diego players' faces before the ball game on the field. Here's McReynolds, one for two tonight with a run scored. So Nettles at second, and Kennedy at first. Not a lot of speed on the bases. Breaking pitch down and away. But indeed, if you look at Dick Williams, you just take your hats off to the fans around the country. And of course, in Chicago, the Cub fans and here in San Diego, it's hard for them to realize at time, Reggie and Earl, how much they mean to a major league ball club and a player out there in a pennant race. 
you play baseball for a long time, I think you realize what fans mean, especially when you know that they can get your adrenaline going. We take a look at this pitch from George Frazier. It is a breaking ball, and it is outside. The 1-1 pitch. That's outside, and it's 2-1. and one. It's a good breaking ball, but it doesn't go over the heart of that plate anymore. Frazier has a type of fastball. As you look at Nettles at second, and Kennedy over at first. Jack Kroll telling him something, the first base coach. His fastball moves all over the plate. It'll sink one time, sail another time. He has really got a lively arm. It's a good situation to hit in right here. Two balls, one strike. The pitcher struggling. Got to look for a fastball and whale. Foul right side. That is what a manager does not like to see when a hitter's <laughs> ahead on the count two and one. Come on, come on. You're a pitcher and you're a manager. That's what the hitter wants to see. Two balls and a strike. Sit back and wave. Yeah, but don't shake it. Well, I'd like to say this. That's one true. of the reasons that Sutcliffe is 16 and one is you, you're not going to get the fastball with him at two balls and one strike. That's right. I think there's a pattern in the American League I know that I have found. My 17 years I've played in the league is that the successful pitchers are able to get any pitch that they can throw over at any particular time in the count. Curveball, fastball, slider, changeup. They can throw it any time in the count and get it over the plate. And that's why the great ones are successful. Carmelo Martinez on deck. The 2-2 pitch to McMillan. Deep to left. Matthews going back to the wall of the warning track. Jumps! It's gone! Home run, Kevin McReynolds, and the Padres have broken it open, 7-1. to one. Padres on top, and here's Martinez. He takes outside. I'll tell you what, I don't think McReynolds got all of that ball. He got that up towards the trademark a little, and I think that tells you a little of his strength. He did, and I don't know if Frazier wanted to throw the pitch there, but it was in on him a little bit, and it was by the trademark. Now, I've always felt that for a guy to hit more than 20 home runs in the major leagues, that he had to be able to miss the ball and hit the ball out of the ballpark. Exactly, as we witnessed right there. Dernier is there, retreats, makes the catch. And right now, let's go back down to Tim McCormick. All right, Don, we have Jackie McReynolds with us. Kevin, of course, with a big three-run home run. That may have put this game out of reach. What do you think, Jackie? I think it's great. I'm so excited. Yeah! Now let's go back up to the booth that Don drives there. Well, there's some happiness and joy in that McReynolds family right there. And this will bring on... Templeton, who takes up high, want to know the count. And Templeton, if everything stays the same, will have the game-winning RBI in this game. Takes the breaking pitch for the strike. Well, I'll tell you, that double that Templeton hit in the sixth inning, it looked like a deer out there in center field. And Bobby <laughs> Dernier, when he cut across trying to cut that ball off, he really can scoop. Well, that was the play that turned him around offensively. It got action on the bases. It got people running all over the place. And it created excitement here in San Diego Stadium with the fans and on the bench. It had all kinds of people moving, moving at the same time. You'd be surprised what that does for both players. Also probably will create a fourth game. Chopper and Sandberg will go on to Durham and that will do it. Almost pull him off the bag. But the Padres come up with four big runs on four hits. No errors and they leave nobody. We're through six complete from San Diego. The Padres lead it seven to one. On say will lead it off. Takes a strike. 
Jose, one for two, has driven in the only Cub run in the second inning. Seven to one, the Padres on top. Bounce foul by Don Zimmer. All one to the count. Popeye, he'll go get it. That'll get some of the booze off his back for booting that ball. <laughs> Tell you one thing, you talk about an arm on a man who was a shortstop. That Zimmer could throw the Art Fowler used to say right strawberries to a battleship. Just outside, one and two the count. Whitson, we understand now from Little Irwin, Tennessee. There's Popeye. And sometimes people say, why do you call him Popeye? Well, we'll get another look at him and let you be the judge. Popeye. There he is. Look at that jaw. Tell you, there was a man that was recruited by the late and great Bear Bryant as a quarterback out of high school in Cincinnati. I didn't know that. Yes, sir. Out of play. That's tomorrow night. It'll be game number three from Tiger Stadium. The Kansas City Royals and the Detroit Tigers. The Tigers up two games in zip. That is 8 o'clock Eastern, and it appears that we've got a good chance of a stays the way it is coming right back here on Saturday. They've We're got it going four. now, Donnie. <laughs> oh, they got that wave, I'll tell you. There's Nettle. That patented play throws him out. Well, Earl, should we stay the way we are? What do you think? Look at this. First of all, look at this play. Oh, you know, I wonder how he did it in New York, but it just seems like time and time again he turned that glove any way he wanted to and came up with the baseball. Here's a nice backhand. I'm sure that Ronnie Say remembers a 1978 World Series when we were down two games to nothing, and every time Ron Guidry let it go, the Dodgers hit it and put it in play hard, and Greg Nettle seemed to look at his glove, and there it was. Shades of the 1970 series with Brooks Robinson. Nettle still very deep at third. Davis with a high fly ball and Templeton going out and calling in front of Martinez. Two gone and that was way up in the air. And a reminder that the National League Championship Series and ABC Sports exclusive is being brought to you by Old Milwaukee and Old Milwaukee Light. It doesn't get any better than this. But Earl, I was talking about what about there's a pitching decision to be made now if they go to game four should the game stay like it is well we have an off day tomorrow and Jim Fry's thinking about who might be starting Saturday as we get a ground ball to second base to throw to first and we'll talk about that pitching change later on and we will now go to the bottom of the seventh inning it is seven to one the Padres on top will be back with more baseball after this word from our local station great pictures yesterday in Chicago and some great ones again here tonight in San Diego as Ed Whitson stands in 0 for 2. <laughs> one thing, that man from Tennessee doesn't get cheated, does he? He's trying to join the party, isn't he? <laughs> He's from a little town called Irwin, Tennessee. That's 40 minutes from the Smoky Mountains. And the only way to get out of Irwin, you've got to go over the mountain. Outside, one and one to count. Must be the only way to get in, too. <laughs> That's about it. There's Eric Shaw. Now that might tell you something right there. What would that think about there right there? Definitely Earl? does. It looks like he's got the fourth game for San Diego. There's an off day and it allows the managers, if they so desire, to bring that first game pitcher back for three days rest. I think I know what he's going to do. He's going to come back with Shaw. That come was back Dick with Williams. Shaw. We looked That's at right. it. He only went four innings in that first game, so he will have plenty of rest. And there's Fry. And he, Harris Fry, he was non-committal before the game. He didn't want to talk about a fourth game, but after the game, he's going to have to make a decision, too. Will it be Sutcliffe or will it be Scott Sanderson? The Winston down on strikes, and the Padres will go to the top of the order. Well, I'll tell you what it did for Dick Williams, too. That home run by that young man right there, Kevin McReynolds. He sat the big goose down in a hurry. He didn't have to bring him in with that 7-1 to lead. Well, he's got an off day tomorrow. I don't think he'd mind pitching goose uh, tonight. I don't think he'd mind pitching him uh, no. Saturday and Sunday. He'd no. go with him. Oh, well, what I meant is in the 4-1 to ball game, and now you break it open and get three more in that respect. I almost just wonder, though, Don, whether you'd like to see Goose Gossett 
get a little work in if you're Dick Williams. If you might maybe get an inning. You're right. One ball and one strike to count. One out, nobody on. 7 11 and 0 for the Padres. 1 4 and 0. There's the Goose for the Cubs. I just think it's exciting to see Goose. I just want to see him in there. And the one hop for Sandberg. Nice, easy play to throw him out. Boy, that young man is talented. He made that play look easy, and the ball was hit hard. If he tries to field it under any other way than the way he fielded it, he would have had trouble on a short out. We get to see it again from the high above third base. Ball hit well, one hop. Now, if he charges that ball or tries to break the first base on, he's going to get it on a short hop. He just drifted back, took it easily on a high hop, and threw the man out at first base. Tony Gwynn takes a strike, and the count is 0-1. Gwynn 3-for-3 three three tonight, a double, two singles, and a run score. Gwynn has hit six balls in the series to the left side, and then he's moved a couple to the right side tonight. And he's hit, he's been up to the plate 11 times, and he's hit the ball hard about seven or eight of those times. He has hit the ball on the button. Well, we've said before, and you've come at it too, Reggie, when you hit 351, you're going to have to hit the ball hard somewhere. And he has, leading all the major leagues in hitting this year, the National League batting champion. Breaking pitch inside, two and one the count. The big thing that I like about Tony Gwynn, and I think for all good young hitters, is to think, put the ball in play hard. Don't try to put it out of play. The count goes even at two and two. Don't tell me you didn't try to put some out of play. Well, that's why I swung and missed 2,000 times. I've got over 2,000 <laughs> strikeouts, so now if you don't want to strike out as much as Reggie Jackson, swing to put it in play and let it go out of play as he fouls that ball down and hits him right below the belly button, below the belt buckle. Two and two the count. Win three and two with Garvey on deck. That was some kind of sinker there. That's either a fork ball or a uh, Gaylord Perry specialty. Well, that's one of those old country fork balls. You got to get on top and turn it over hard. That's all. <laughs> okay. A pitcher will protect the pitcher. <laughs> the old Staten Island sinker went back to Milwaukee. Your man. Yes, he Earl. did. There's one thing you can count on that the Milwaukee pitching staff will have less base on balls this year than they had last year because George Bamberger hates the base on balls. I think all managers do. I know John McNamara wanted to jump off a bridge sometimes or jump off the end of the dugout when pitchers would walk on. Managers just do not like free passes. Full count, three and two. To Durham, he's there. So the Padres are gone one, two, three in the seventh inning. We're through seven from San Diego in game number three. The Padres seven and the Cubs. And he can run. He's got great speed. Well, you see those numbers, left-handers and right-handers. As Whitson starts inning number eight. This is outside. In the count one and oh, you can see Kennedy saying, come on, get that arm up now. Don't get out here and get flopped on me. Outstanding job by Ed Whitson as we look at him. One and one. Well, the great thing about baseball, the great thing about sports, is gives people an opportunity to grow up and make something of themselves. Ed Whitson from a family of eight, five brothers and three sisters. Two balls and a strike to count. He worked on a job before he got into baseball, making eighty-one dollars every two weeks. in that in the minor leagues for a month. <laughs> Earl. <laughs> We're going back a few years. What'd you hit in the you? minor leagues? Oh, I hit well. <laughs> 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 oh, <yeah. laughs> I can hear Palmer with that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I paid well in the minor leagues. <laughs> That's a fine. And once again, Kennedy reminds Whitson. Come on, get that arm up there. Full count three and two to Bosley with the leadoff hitter. Bobby Dernier on deck. 7 to 1, the Padres on top. Struck him out looking. I thought.
thought it was. It looked like a good pitch to me. Get to see it one more time. Just a fastball on the inside half of the plate. To, oh, did you see it come back yes, and sir. grab that corner? He hit the mitt. I can understand why Bosley thought it might be a ball. He took his eye off it. A lot of times that ball will run back out over the it's plate on you. Bob, and you'll want to complain. It'll make you argue, pal. Now there's one gone, and that'll bring on Bob Dernier. He's walked, lined to short, and he's bounced to second. Takes a strike. Looks to me like Whitson wants a complete game. Well, he's charging hard right now. You see he's got his chest stuck out, and he's going after it, pal. He did it the whole game, man. A little high. You can see where Kennedy again dropped his arm. He says, your hand's down. you got to keep it up on top of that breaking pitch. And the funny thing about that is that sacrifice was successful. Ground ball over the first. Two out to the fifth ground ball. And that sacrifice was successful. They might have walked Templeton, and Whitson might not have been in the ball game. So true. Okay. Might have, could have, should have. Shippa. You Shippa. know the biggest word in the world is if. It's bigger than the word baby. smile, and there's a mile between the S and the E. <laughs> but right now, I know it's 7 to 1. Kind of like that old if and ant knuckle little thing. Here's Whitson. He's thrown 100 pitches. Here's Brian Sandberg as he takes a strike, and Whitson indeed coming right at him. Eight thousand three hundred forty six here in San Diego tonight an all time record. One ball and one strike should be the same thing Saturday night. Yes, sir. Be a little more. I bet you for some reason there'll be another couple hundred. A high two and one to count. Sandberg was under the fielder's choice stole a base struck out and lined to center. When I hit three home runs, I've met 700,000 people that were at that game. <laughs> three and one the count. Far down the line, that'll be into the corner. Extra bases into the bullpen as Martinez chases it down. The double by Sandberg. And I mean, he got that top hand up on that. Not to take anything away from him, but that was a 7-1, to 3-1, hit me fastball. I don't want to walk you. You can see it right there, fastball right above the belt. Right down there over the middle of the plate, and he just leans right on it. Well, that's what a pitcher should do with a 7-1 to one lead. Oh, yeah. Do not want to walk anybody. Not at all. That ball hit hard. Number 36. Again, a big Gary advantage Matthews. when you're the Padres right now, and you're Ed Whitson, you know you've got a seven-run lead, you know you've only got a couple innings to play, and you know you've got the big man down in the bullpen ready to bail you out whenever you need him. Yes, sir, and there might have been a little dingling down in that pen because there's a little stirring around as Matthews doesn't get the breaking pitch. And indeed, somebody's throwing a firecracker down on that Padre pen as they stir. Six-run lead. Fifty-four, the goose. Rich Gossett. Up high, and the count one and one. Oh, I tell you, when guys like him and Rich Gossett and Bruce Souter, Lee Smith get up in the bullpen, you just don't like to see it when you're on the opposite <laughs> side of the field. <laughs> Not at all. Say, sit down, man. <laughs> and I'll tell you one thing: since he has gotten up, if he gets loose, we might see him next inning. You can see Matthews barking at the home plate umpire, Terry Bovley. I just thought that might have been a little low, that's all. That's what he plate. thought. He thought that ball was a little bit low. Well, that's one on the umpire can't win. I couldn't tell if it was a ball or a strike. Just outside, the count 2-2. Two -two. little desperation look back there on Matthews after that pitch went by the plate. Well, he was called out on a bad pitch in the first inning.
Check swing, look out. Foul over that Padre dugout. We'll shake him around. Matthews has struck out. He's walked his single. He's one for two. The 2-2 two -two pitch to Matthews. High chopper. Templeton right there. On to Garvey. And that'll do it. The Cubs are gone in the eighth. No runs on a hit. No errors. They leave a man. We go to the bottom of the eighth inning. And the Padres lead the Cubs 7-1. Timmy, thank you very much. As Gossage will continue to get loose to come in and pitch the ninth, the Cubs have made a pitching change. The big right-hander Tim Stoddard comes on. So Stoddard will face Garvey, Nettles, and Kennedy in that order. Interesting stat on tonight's game. The Padres have left only one man on base tonight. They left 14 on in the first two games. The Cubs have left five men on tonight. They left 14 on in the first two games. Mm. Garvey 0 for 3. Fouled out to first. Hit into a double play and bounced to second. Well, one man left on base. They're doing what Reggie talked about in the pregame show, and that's getting the job done. Yes, they are. They've got the offense working tonight. Somebody had gone around and slapped people on the back, and it's working. There are people stepping to the front tonight. Well, it's always interesting to me to see you get the last 10, 15 seconds in a ball game and the score is tied in a basketball game and some guys just are never near the ball. In baseball, it's the same way. Some players just don't want to take charge. The Padres have certainly stepped up and done that tonight. There's a strike one and two. The count. Garvey's not happy with that call. Wasn't a good call. So there's been pitches missed on both sides. Just, just like all the time. Now and off the shin guards of Davis over in a hurry, throws him out. And a reminder that there will be exciting CFA football on ABC. That will continue this Saturday with the top ten powers colliding. You'll see either the Nebraska Cornhuskers facing the unbeaten 4-0 for Oklahoma State Cowboys or a battle of the SEC rivals Georgia and Alabama. And a week from this Saturday, the number one ranked Texas Longhorns battle the number three Oklahoma Sooners. And the games, of course, will be seen right here live on ABC. 3.30 Eastern time as Nettle stands in. That is to the right side, and Durham will give it to Stoddard, and that will do it. So there's two gone. And a reminder, too, that the way it's going right now, that we'll be back right here at San Diego on Saturday night, and that'll be at 8 Eastern time, Game 4, the National League Championship Series. And don't forget, tomorrow night, while the National League takes a day off, the American League will resume again at Tiger Stadium in Detroit. The Royals trying to get on the board themselves. The Tigers, two games to zip in their third game of their series as Kennedy fouls it away. Gossage getting ready to go. I think Earl was saying earlier, Denier and Sandberg got on base. The big guys delivered. That's the way it happened tonight. Wiggins and Wynn got on base. And Nettles, Kennedy, and McReynolds all delivered big blows. Just uh, you got to have somebody on there to give you a chance if you're in the center of the lineup. Well, that's the way the Cubbies have been doing it the first two games. And tonight, the Padres do it. Inside. One and two. As big as this man is. About six foot four, 235 pounds. Six, six and a half or seven. Six, six and a half. You've got to crowd him. You've got to keep the ball in on him. You let him extend his arm, and he's going to hurch you. That's why he's got so much power to left field. Excuse me, Reg. I meant Stoddard. I thought you were talking <laughs> oh, about out on that Terry Kennedy is almost as big as Stoddard, I'll tell you. He's, he's about big. six four, six five, Earl. A 2-2 two -two pitch to Kennedy. Did he go around? Yes, he did. And Kennedy knew it, started to walk away, looked to just to check. Padres are gone in the eighth inning. Three up, three down as you look at it one more time. Kennedy goes around and he knew it. So seven to one, the Padres on top after eight. We'll be back after this message and a word from our local station. Oh, another beautiful shot from our Goodyear blimp high above Jack Murphy Stadium here in San Diego. Top of the ninth inning, man. There's the goose. You know, it's amazing when you think about Jack Murphy Stadium tonight, an all-time major league record. The as first pitch, you talk about power to power Durham to Gossage, but 
It's named after a gentleman here in San Diego who was really instrumental in bringing Major League Baseball here, a writer for San Diego for the Union, Jack Murphy. And I'll tell you, it's, he's gone right now, but he would love to have seen this day. This is a great sight, I'll tell you. And Durham quickly down one, two, three. And that was the breaking ball from Goose Gossett. When a man throws 97 to 100 miles an hour, <laughs> and all of a sudden he throws you a breaking ball, you might as well just save your swing and energy because you're not going to hit it. We see it right here for the hard one. Down and in exactly where it's supposed to be. The pitch before was 92 miles an hour. But that's still hard enough Let to get you looking fastball. Well, one of the reasons he's in the ball game tonight, this is the only inning he's pitched in seven days. So he needs the work. I think along with that, I think that just the emotional uplift that he'll give the crowd, the team, and the city, just to see Goose Gossett out there, is going to work wonders for these people. The center field, McReynolds is right there. And there's two gone in the ninth. left the 58,346 on their feet as they look for out number three and it'll be Ron Say. <laughs> Remember this in 1981 Say with the Dodgers and Gussie with the Yankees the fifth game. Boy I'll tell you. Accidents happen that's why you should wear that ear flap on that helmet. They're trying to bring in a double ear flap. But I know that say has got to be thinking about that right now he hollers outside to the umpire 95 Who might it. even be saving a little bit even at 95 miles an hour that's the story two outs in the ninth out of play they're not booing they're just saying goose and it's 0 and 2 that was 98 and the uh -oh. Cubs are down to their final strike in their it final sounds like he's just starting to get loose from 92 to 95 I guess. Outside. One and two. You think that isn't a menacing <laughs> sight to see that big guy coming at you, legs, arms, and 90 foot three, 230 pounds, and he's all over the place at you. Look at that. Curveball. That hangs inside. Curveball. Like to be hitting right now. No. Look at this pitch. There's no purpose here. He's just throwing the ball as hard as he can right now. I'd like you to take notice. If he's throwing him a breaking ball right now, you've got to wait that much longer if you're a hitter. That's why the guys that throw this hard, you've almost got to give them their breaking ball and do nothing but look for the fastball. Because if you're looking for a curveball, he throws a fastball inside, you're hit. There's no question about that. <laughs> and Ron Say had a good swing at that next pitch. Well, that's why I say the professional that he is. That will get him. Retires aside as the Padres get on the board in the championship series. Gossett comes in and strikes out two out of the three. One, two, three. The Cubs are gone in the ninth inning. A happy dugout right there. Dick Williams has got another reprieve. 